tell us your name, please, and spell it. My name is Rose Nablach. It's spelled K-N-O-B-L-O-C-H. What was your name at birth? And spell it, please. First name. Maiden name. Oh, Paluch, P-A-L-U-C-H. Did you have any other names? No. Did you have any nicknames? Ruszka. It's the Polish name for Rose. And how would you spell that? R-O-Z-K-A. What's your date of birth? Uh, February 20, 1923. And so what is your age now? Uh, 72. What is the city and country of your birth, please, and spell them? The city is Uyas. It's spelled U-J-A-Z-D. Country Poland, P-O-L-A-N-D. Where in Poland was it? Was it near any large city? Uh, not far from Lodz. 40 kilometers from Lodz. What kind of city was it? How big? Uh, was, it was a big city. There were 600,000 Jews. It was an industrial city. It was called the Second Manchester. And what was made there? How big was the <clears throat> how big was the Jewish population? As far as I know, it was six hundred thousand. Out of how many? Out of uh, two and a half million, I think. And how were the relations between the Jews and the non-Jews? Well. Uh, In certain areas, you didn't, you didn't feel anti-Semitism. In small towns, you did, like in, like in Uyast, uh, you were called Jid, uh, uh, Jid de Palestine, I mean, Jews go to Palestine. Uh, in our area, there were no, no pogroms, no, no physical fights. But, but you hear the, those things, the, the Jew. Did I understand you correctly that your town, 600,000, or the greater Lodge area? Lodge, Lodge, no. Our town, where I was born, the small mm -hmm. town, I don't even know, a few thousand Jews. And were the Jews mostly religious, or? Mostly were religious, right? Mostly Orthodox. And in your town, what was the livelihood mostly? Describe it. How did it look? Uh, it was a very small town. Most of them were merchants or uh, shoemakers, tailors, uh, bakers, mm -hmm. things like this, small stores. Uh, once, uh, once a week was uh, a market where the people from villages come, came and uh, bought things in the market and no Jewish uh, merchants in the market. Were there Jewish schools and synagogues? There was a synagogue and there were little Stiebler. School? Uh, no, we all went to public school. And uh, after public school, it was the Feder. And tell us, please, what were the Stiebelach? What they were the Stiebelach? They were small. They were like a Gelle Stiebel, a Domske Stiebel, a, a Sgerge Stiebel. That's the only thing. They weren't think. synagogues. They were yeah, like little gatherings little where people little, prayed. Yeah, and then these were Hasidim. Shtiblech were Hasidim, certain rabbis. And each shtibel was for a particular rabbi. Right. It was named after them. Like the Gerzha Shtibel, the Gerzha Rabbi, the Adomsky Rabbi, the Gerzha Rabbi. And then there was a synagogue for the general. 
And who was the rabbi of the synagogue, do you remember? Yeah, I happened to know him. He was a good friend of ours. His name was Lasnowski, and he was from Pabianice. It's mentioned in that book that you are reading. Can you spell that? L-A-Z-N-O-W-S-K-I. And can you spell the place where he was from? Pabianice, yeah. P A B. J A N I C E. Was that a bigger town than New York? This was a small London. This was near Lodge. Uh huh. He's near Lodge. It was like the outskirts of Lodge. Uh huh. <coughs> Excuse me. And was he a Chassid too? That he was friends with your family? No, he was just a good friend. I don't remember him being no. a person. No. Beautiful person, beautiful family. His daughter went to go to school with me. What was her name? Do you remember? Oh, yeah. Ripcha. R-I-W-C-I-A. Ripcha, my favorite friend. Now, yeah. tell us about um, your family. Good memories. Okay. My family? Yeah. Well, my father was originally from Piotkov. There were two Piotkovs. Piotkov is spelled P-I-O-T-R-K-O-W. And he was from Piotkov Tribunalski. T-R-Y-B-U-N-A-L-S-K-I. This, this is the Piotkov he was from. Uh, and what was his name? Abraham. 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 Um, well, they lived in, we, we asked, uh, we lived together with our grandfather, my, my grandfather, I didn't know. This was your father's father my, or your mother's? My mother's, my mother's mother. And, uh, my grandfather was a grain, grain merchant, and my father had the little textile store. And there were three of us. My brother was also a little chosset, went to, to Haida, had payers, went to yeshiva. Uh, I we went to, there was no private school, we went to public school. Uh, public school wasn't wasn't the most desirable school. They, there were a small percentage of students Jewish. The rest of them were Christians. And uh, Saturday, of course, we didn't go to school. Uh, so it so happened that Saturday they picked the most important subjects, and this created a problem for us. So when we did to do the homework, what was taught on Saturday, we had to sort of bargain with the, with the Gentiles. Like I was good in arithmetic, so I did the work in arithmetic, and, and they gave me all the, the information that was done on, on Shabbos. Did you ever play together with these non-Jewish children? Did you have friends? or? Very seldom, just, just in school, you know, we sort of kept separate. Did you experience any um, anti-Semitism among your schoolmates? Did they call you names? Yeah. Zizia. Daddy Joe. Did you ever come to blows? No. no. So the boys sometimes did. There were boys and girls together. Mm -hmm. No, there were no fists for it. Your brother was older than you or younger? Older. And what was his name? Joseph. But he, he didn't go, he went only to Cheder. He didn't go to public school. And the Cheder was in your town or yeah. in another yes, town? Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Was it a Cheder from a particular Rebbe? No, general Cheder. There weren't too many. It was only one. Mm -hmm. Now you said you had a third sibling. My sister. What was she her? was the oldest. What was her name? Her name was Nechama. 
she was born she was born after the 1940 or 60 after world war 2 so nahama means uh, redemption after world war after world war 1 one yeah and what was your mother's name Hava and your grandfather my grandfather's name mm -hmm. Avram Yitzchak Lieberman. The other one I, I didn't know. My father's father didn't know. Were your parents an arranged marriage? Yes. Everybody's marriage was arranged in those times. What was um, the house like where you lived? What did it look like? Well, it was, it was a house like in a small town. Comfortable house. Uh, everybody has their bedroom. My grandfather has his room. I remember my grandfather had a room where, uh, on sukkahs, it was a sukkah. He opened. Uh, you took off the uh, roof? The roof, you opened it, and then you put that, uh, what you call it, uh, bamboo shades, or I get the, instead of schach. Um, it was a nice warm house. That's a fun family. Did it have garden around? Yeah, we had a little garden in the back. Yeah, we even had the janitor. Did you grow your own food? No. No. Small garden with flowers. And you went to public school. What was your religious education? Just what I learned in Cheder and with my grandfather. And what did he teach you? To read, mm -hmm. to daven. We had to daven every day before we went to school. Uh, Saturday in the Perek, and Saturday in the winter, the Bochinavshi. I didn't get an education like they have here in the day schools. Mainly concentrated on davening. So you knew it by heart, probably. I knew by heart. Did every day, Shmoneska, the, the benching. I knew by heart. Yeah. What was a typical day like? Well, you got up in the morning. Uh, school. I think we had to be at seven thirty. It was always very diligent. It was always the first one in school. Uh, in school, I don't remember how long it lasted. One, two o'clock. You went home. home for lunch? No, I took a sandwich. Right? And uh, came home, homework, playing. The regular routine. Were you a terrific student? I was a good student in arithmetic and geography. These were my two favorite subjects. And what were your least favorite? Art. <laughs> Drawing. And who were your friends? The rabbi's daughter was one. Yeah. Everybody was a friend. It's a small town. Everybody was a friend. How did you okay. celebrate? Shabbos and the holidays? Well, Friday was preparation for Shabbos. Like, like here. Shabbos morning, uh, we didn't go to show like, like here, they go to show. And then the men came home and lunch, after lunch, we went for walks, we went to, to the woods. Uh, it was fun. Especially in summer, it was part of it when I had to rush home for the parak. <laughs> had to be home at a certain hour to say parak. In summer, and in winter we played in friends' houses. We didn't have toys. We didn't. I mean, this goes back toys. We school year already. Uh, we didn't have what the kids have here, but we didn't know any better. What were the, the atmosphere was nice and warm. Yeah. What were the big holidays like? Like 
Pesach, Rosh Hashanah. Like the holidays here. For Pesach, where did you bake your matzahs, for instance? They were bakers that baked matzahs. We didn't bake our own matzahs. No. I remember the baker, I think, uh, the kosher for Pesach and the baked matzahs. I think a lot of um, people, not bakers, that they took part, they baked their own matzah. It was a mitzvah to bake their own matzah, as far as I remember. Would you have a lot of people for a Seder or just your family? The family, and then uh, there was uh, an aunt and uncle and some kids. Because the rest of the family, my mother's sisters and brothers, they lived already in, in Lodge in Warsaw. So there was just uh, one aunt and uncle left, and, and, and we asked. I'm talking about. When, when I wasn't real yet. And what books or newspapers might have been in your house? Only religious ones or secular also? The secular too. In the library, there was a school library that we took books and we read novels. And Sienkiewicz was the Polish poet that was in the lot, Mitzkiewicz. You know, it was a school library. And yes. what languages did you know or speak? Or? Polish, Yiddish. That's about it. Mm -hmm. What was your first inkling that things were changing? You mean? As far as the political situation. Well, then I was already in Lodz. I finished. Well, How old were you when you went to Lodge? Oh, this was 1923, about 14 years, 14, 13, 14 years old. So that would have been 1936, 37. 37. Yeah. Why did you go to Lodge? Because there was no high school in asked. So I went to Lodge to stay with my aunt and to go to high school. You went yourself? Yeah. My, son, my parents. Your parents stayed? They stayed in the West, yeah. And your brother? My brother remained in the West, my sister too. I was the only one who left for lunch. And you stayed with your aunt and my uncle? My aunt and uncle, she was my mother's sister. And she didn't have any girls, she had two sons. She liked me a lot. And she wanted me to be there and talk to her. And it was a, an apartment in what neighborhood or what this address? Do you remember? In Lodge, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Zamenhof. I told you this. Would Zamenhof. you spell? Yeah. Z A M E N um, H O F A. Zamenhof. He was the founder of the Esperanto language. And it so happened that I had a cousin on Zamenhof in Lodge, 13, and he married. A girl from Warsaw, Warsaw lived in Zamenhof, 13. None of them survived. Uh -huh. Was the apartment in a Jewish a neighborhood? It was a German neighborhood. The Deutsche Gymnasium was not far from. Um, they had a store, uh, tobacco and uh, not a tobacco store. Uh, it was a German neighborhood, but there were Jewish people there, but and mostly Jewish. religious Jewish people? Yeah, religious and non-religious, yeah. And your aunt and uncle? Were religious. Were religious. Yeah. Did she cover her hair? And no, my mother did. The aunt didn't. No, no. What were their names? Gerbe. G-E-R-B-E-R. And first names? Chaya. Her name was Chaya. His name was Moshe. And the boys? My cousin's name was Pinchas, and the other one, Chaim. Chaim was in Israel. He left. He left just before the war. He went to the University of Jerusalem, and he's alive. It's the only cousin that is alive. Mm -hmm. So they had the tobacco store, and you went 
to high school? Right. Public high school or religious high school? No, it wasn't a religious mm. high school. It was a high school, not public. The name was um, Yashuska. J A S Z U N S K I A. Yashuska. What did you study there? At the high school, whatever you, it's a high school. It was called gymnasium in, in, in Poland. It's a high school, it was a high school. We studied uh, not, not Jewish subjects. And did you have Jewish after yeah. school also? Yeah, we yeah. belonged to an uh, organization. Yeah. <coughs> what organization? Uh, Bess Yaakov. Or Benos. And this was after school? Uh, mostly on weekends. After school there wasn't, there wasn't enough time. Who were your friends from this time? Do you remember any of their names? Uh, any of the names? Hardly any. There was so. Uh, there was uh, Sarah Berkowitz. There was, was. I can hardly remember. Mm -hmm. So in 1936 37, in Lodge. You became aware of things beginning to change? Yeah, 1938, you know, they were already talking. Actually, it started when Hitler came to power in 1933. Yeah, so the newspapers, radio, and uh, we were aware of what was going on in Germany. We just didn't know that, that Poland was going to be attacked in 1939. And this I remember vividly when Poland was attacked in 1939. We were all prepared. We had gas masks. We were told to go up in the attic and uh, to protect ourselves. And then one day, it was a Friday morning, we woke up and we heard Hitler. Hitler is already, the Germans are already in Lodz. It was frightening. And then then the, the Germans, the, the neighbors, because this was a German neighborhood, came in with the, with the German soldiers, the neighbors. On a Friday night, I remember, uh, we were sitting and eating dinner. And they came in. This was supposed to be our friends. And went in with, with the boots sort of thing, on the table. Uh, opened, there was a, a clock opened the clock, looked for things that were hidden there, and the, went all over and, and uh, looked for things. It was frightening. They looked like murderers. We know how much they liked us. And uh, it's when, when the trouble started. When was this Making, exactly? This in was 1939, probably in September. Right after the war. So right after, right after, after they Right after they in. marched in to Poland, yeah. And then after this Friday night, what was the next thing that happened? Well, the store didn't open anymore. There was constant vandalizing, cleaning out the store, taking things away. Uh, then my aunt had a good friend, a neighbor, a German, so we gave things to her. She should, she should keep it for us, and after the war, hopefully she'll give it back to us. Uh, didn't take place. My aunt and uncle uh, left then Lodge. They went to Warsaw, because Lodge was included in the Dritte Reich, it was called. Uh, the, uh, the Third Reich. Third Reich. And uh, Warsaw was supposed to be safer because it was 
protectorate it was called. Uh -huh. It wasn't included in the, in the, in the Dritte Reich. Uh, and they went to the Loja Ghetto. We never, we never heard from them. In the meantime, my, my parents came from Uyast because they burned down uh, the houses in, in 1939. No, this was already when they left. It was later. I, I jumped from 39 oh. to uh, from to they left was about 1940. My parents uh, came also 1940. Yeah. Or was it maybe the end of 1939? Because so your aunt and your aunt and uncle left, left in to Warsaw. Your cousins. My cousin, my cousin, the younger one was in Israel already, and the older one was working in Warsaw yet before the war. Yeah, their position, her position. So you stayed in the apartment. I was there until my parents came. My parents got an apartment in the ghetto, in the lodge ghetto. So and I, then and you I moved out of this apartment and Not you this apartment. joined them. This apartment wasn't included in the ghetto. We were we were evacuated from this area uh -huh. to to the ghetto, which it was the the worst part of lodge. Where the, there were no Jews there before the war. It was. Uh, most part of of, of of Lodge, poorest. Do you remember the address? Yeah. In the ghetto? Yeah. Yeah. With the Do we have spelling? It's a long yes, word. Yes, please. It's a long word. W R Z E S N I E S K A 20. Was the number? It was one, one, one room, and we didn't get any. In winter, we didn't get any. There was no central heating like it was here. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a little what you call the stove or oven. We didn't get coal or wood to heat, and I remember the walls were covered with snow, with frost. There were icicles on there on the walls, the small room. What floor was it on? Uh, it was the second floor. It was a little uh, frame house. Was and there electricity? I'm not sure. Plumbing? No, no plumbing, no. There was an outhouse? There was no plumbing, yeah. yeah there was no plumbing, no. Plumbing for sure, not electricity. I, I don't remember. Maybe there was some. And uh, we lived there for 1942, 1942. Uh, my poor mother had to go to work, had to walk so far. She was, she looked like a skeleton. Uh, we got our rations uh, once a week. It, it was enough for one day. And in this one room lived me how many? and my father and, and, and my mother. My yes. sister remained there in the not far from we as Tomashu. Okay. Fifteen nineteen ninety five in Chicago. Interviewer Phyllis Driesen. In the um, little room, there were the three of you. Three of us, right? Your sister stayed. My sister stayed there, not far from we asked in Tomashov. Uh, she just couldn't. They closed it, and she couldn't come to to be with us. It was too late for her to come. Why she was there, I, I guess, felt the safer there than my parents and I don't know, because I was in Lodge when this did happen. Mm -hmm. Did you ever see her again? No. No. I can hardly remember even what she looks like. She was the oldest. And your brother? My brother is alive. 
my brother I, I found after the war, yeah. And where did he go? He, he, was, he was in lodge, in the beginning he was in lodge ghetto with us, and then there was no food, he was hungry, he was, and he volunteered to go to Germany. He went to Germany, and he was in a, not in concentration camp in the beginning, in a labor camp, Arbeitslager it was called. And in the beginning he wrote us letter and sent some cigarettes for my father, and this lasted only for a short time, then we didn't hear from him. And then after the war you found out? After, after the war that I didn't expect even to find him, because he, he went from the first one, and uh, I went with, when I came from, from Czechoslovakia with my husband, we went to Munich, there everybody was registered. And I looked at the registration list, and there was his name. And uh, I was amazed. I was, I can't describe the way I felt. And we looked up the address, and we went there. And he had a little room with a German family. And he wasn't there when we went there. Uh, and I just said, so he had a picture, something. I couldn't believe this was him. And good enough, it was him. And uh, he was he was a good worker, and somehow he survived. He did all kind of work, and miraculously he survived. And he came. You can imagine. I remember when when we went from the from the Jewish Yiddish Gemeinde, where it was the registration list. I, I was already married, and I came with my husband. And we went. Uh, I almost got run over a car. You know. I, I didn't watch the traffic, nothing. I just, it was much excitement. It was my, it was my bread. I couldn't believe it was him, but it was him. And you recognized each other? Yeah, yeah. I can imagine the scene. I saw each other. <coughs> when you moved into the ghetto, what time of year was it? Was it winter already? I think it was really winter, late fall. And how did they move you in? Your parents came for you and then you all went mm -hmm. together? Yeah. By this time I was already, my aunt and uncle had left already for Warsaw. Mm -hmm. By this time I was already with my parents. And we were evacuated because, this, oh yeah, when my parents came first they had a little, a little apartment which was yet included in the ghetto. And then they took away this part. Belonged to, didn't belong anymore to the ghetto, so we had to move. Uh, what we took from us, just the, the necessities. And the we, necessities. What, there was no transportation, I think. You um, had to carry them yourself on your back? or you had A little to, wagon, I think, yeah. yeah. The ghetto people provided. So what was included in that? The mattresses, kitchen utensils, just the bare necessities. Ghetto was, was hell, just watching my parents deteriorating. My mother had lost so much weight, and my father too, and she had to, to go to work. She never walked in her life, yet she had to go to work and walk far. And the rations were just so small, just the minimum. The slice of bread was enough for one day, and this was supposed to last for a whole week. My mother was pleading with me, I should eat it because I'm young. You know, just developing, I need, I need the nourishment. She can do without it. And of course I didn't want it. And it was a constant struggle. She wanted me to eat her rations. It was, it was very painful to watch them. They both looked like skeletons. What kind of work did she do? Um, well, most of the work was we were making uh, clothes for the Germans, sewing. Did you work with her? I worked in a different uh, 
which was much closer than I wish I would walk there, though I had to walk so far, but that's how they wanted. Uh, not together, but uh, it was a branch, I think, of this, the tree that was called shop where they were making dresses, shirts for Germans. Who assigned the work? There were Jewish Jewish uh, people who were on the shelf. Who assigned it was for the Germans, but the Jews were in charge of it. How much did you earn? I don't think we got paid at all in the ghetto. No? No. How did you get your food? Just the rations once a week. I don't think we had to pay. Did you have ration cards? Oh, yeah, there was ghetto money. There was ghetto money. Ration cards, yeah, there was ghetto money. Rumkowski, you know, the picture of the, of the, of the money. How did it look like? Piece of paper. Mm -hmm. uh, what was it called? Mark, ghetto mark, something mm -hmm. like this. Who remembers? And what did you, you use? Was it? Store to go. What did you, you use? <sighs> what did you pay for with it? Did you pay rent on your room? No, not that I know of. Not that I know of, no. Were you assigned? Okay, probably only for the rations, because there was no stores. There was mm -hmm. no, you couldn't buy a paper, you could buy a book, you couldn't. Just for the, for the, for the rations, for the groceries, probably. Did your father mm -hmm. have a job also? Yeah, he also had to, everybody had to work. What was he doing? Shoe, shoe factory, shoe shop, I think. No. It was very painful to watch them, the way they looked. Just watched them deteriorating until the last moment. They were so weak and so, and so fragile. And this was the worst part, just to watch your parents deteriorating. My father had swollen legs from hunger. This was, most, most men had walked around in the ghetto with swollen legs. Back under the eyes, swollen on the face. It was hell, it was hell. One can't describe. I... What was the worst? Not, 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 not hearing from your sister, from your brother, from your relatives. Not knowing what's going on in the world, and and cold and hunger, and always frightened. Never knew when the Germans are going to come and tell a peel and, and take you and, and, and send you away. It was hell. How I survived, I don't know. How I survived all this, I don't know. And after this concentration camp, after the concentration camp, not finding the family, it's a miracle that I'm alive. How long were you together with your parents? <coughs> well, they came at the end of 1939 to 1942. 1942. The Germans came, and Ali wouldn't run tell, you wouldn't run tell. You understand what it means? Yeah. All, all Jews, Jews, all Jews out. out. Yeah. That's that's when they already took the people to to the crematoriums. Uh, so we all went down. We were afraid, you know, the Germans would come and they'll find us in the house. They will shoot us, so we all went down. You went down to where? To the backyard, to the yard. There was a little yard there. There were four Jewish families in that little building. To the yard. 
and uh, so they took, they separated me from my parents. Not only me, there were two other young girls that they wanted to keep us in the ghetto and get us for work. And the parents said that they're taking them to labor camp. They're trying to save them because the Russians are are going to take over. They want to just want to save them. So I said I I want to go with my parents. And I want to be free. So they didn't give me a hard time. I went with my parents. They took us to a hospital where a day before a cousin of mine who was sick was in the hospital. The whole hospital was evacuated. Uh, so that's why we got to think if they evacuated the sick ones, what did they do with the sick people? It's probably something going to happen with us. My mother pleaded with me, she pleaded with the Jewish policemen, I should, I should go back, just that I went voluntarily, that maybe we'll hear yet from my sister, from my brother, that I should go back. So the Jewish policemen helped me get out, and I went back, and I was the only one there left in that little, in that little building. And I remember this was the day when they were given the rations only once a week, and there was a big line, and the line sometimes you stood for a whole day, seven hours, eight hours, and I went to the line to get the ration. I remember when I was close to getting into the store, the door, I walked away, I didn't want, I didn't want the food, I walked away. When my parents were taken away from me, what, what, what do I need food for? But I walked away without the food. Then, after, after this was over and I went, my aunt and, and her daughter and her granddaughter did, they, were, they were hiding, and, and they did not, they were not caught by the Germans, they were hiding. And I found out that they are still in the ghetto. This is and a different this, aunt. Uh, this is a different aunt. This was my, my mother's brother. And the bro the, my brother's, my uncle did pass away in the ghetto, and his wife and daughter and granddaughter remain in the ghetto. And I went, I went to them, and then I remained with them until, until, until we all went voluntarily because they made it already impossible to stay in the ghetto because the rations weren't given anymore. We couldn't get out. Uh, they were constantly. Uh, catching Jews like you catch fish in the water and, and, and sending them away to unknown places. So the four of us volunteered to go. They took us in those uh, wagons. Uh, the wagons were full of people already, and people took with them beets and potatoes and carrots, whatever they had in their own little garden. And we were like, like kettles on, on those wagons. The kettles were designed for, the wagons were designed for kettles. When was this? Uh, this was in 1944. 1944, yeah, 1942, 1944. Probably July, June, July. And this one, and we were laying on, on the floor of the wagons like, 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 like a kettle, and people were eating the raw beets and the raw potato, whatever one had. Uh, nothing was given to us, and uh, there were no facilities. There was no, there was no water. I think they gave us something. Once in a while, I think they gave us like a, a pail of water. And the, the wagon took us to Auschwitz. How long was the ride? 
14 hours, 16 hours. But one day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, when he came to Auschwitz, they uh, had to line up, they separated the young one from the older one. Was it day or night when you arrived? Day, daytime, yeah. So when they opened the door, what did, what when, did you see? When they opened the door, we saw people who, who lived there, who were there and working in, in, in Auschwitz, in the camps, with those striped suits. We saw them marching on the, the SS uh, commando. And uh, then they took us to, we had a lot of walking to do, it was hard, to a barrack where we had to undress. Uh, we had to stand in front of the assessed people, completely naked. Yeah, this was when they already separated my, my aunt. You said that they put my aunt on one, on one side, and me and my, and the little girl who was four years old, she looked like Shirley Temple, <coughs> together with my aunt, and me and my cousin on the other side. My cousin said she wants to go with her mother. What was her mother. name, your cousin? Rachel. And your aunt? My aunt was Leah. And the family name? And the Lieberman. Lieberman. And the my, maiden, my mother's maiden name was Lieberman, and she was a sister-in-law to my mother. And the little girl? The little girl was Finka, was her name. Finka, her musical name. She, was, she looked like Shirley Temple. So sweet. She was one and only daughter. That's the that's that cousin who went with us. So my cousin said she wants to go with her with her little girl and her mother. So they went. And then... Who made the selection? The assess people, the Gestapo. Not Mangala. Mangala. I never saw Mangala, no. Maybe, well, I don't, know. I don't think she, he, he did such dirty work. He was higher echelon. And did you know by now did you have an no. idea no, no, where they no, were being no, separated? No, 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 I had no idea. Then, uh, okay, they shaved my head, and uh, and we were standing uh, in front of the Gestapo people. They were making fun, completely naked. Uh, And then they gave us the, the dress with the stripes, which was like a sack fabric. And they took us to the field, which was raining on. You know, this was later than, than July, August. What did I say, July, August? This must have been October, because it was cold and it was raining. And we were laying all night on, in the fields and freezing, the head shaved, you can imagine. Oh, my aunt, my, my aunt and, and, and my cousin, and my cousin already didn't know where they went. Then uh, the girls who were walking there, who were walking there for many years, uh, you know, we saw a chimney and smoke you know, all the time, all day, all night, 24 hours, around the clock. So we asked what it is. He said, what are you pretending, you foolish girls? Don't you know what it is? This is, this is where everybody who, who doesn't come on this side will say, it's where everybody goes at the guest chambers. Uh, and I asked, you know, what happened? Did people from Lodge Ghetto come here in 1942? Yeah, yeah, they all came here. They all went up in the flames there. That's when I found out. I will never see my parents again. They kept us there for two days with hardly any food. And then they sent us to concentration camp, which was on the German-Czechoslovakian border. Mm -hmm. It was called Bad Kudova. 
He worked in an airplane factory. Uh, it was a night shift and a day shift, 12 hours. Night shift. Uh, we were given wooden shoes that they were twice as big as my foot. My foot was sliding around. I got blisters on my on my feet. Uh, we came back after 12 hours and one slice of bread with a bowl of soup, uh, which was guy called Rabi, that, that you saw the, the drippings of, of rats, probably, uh, that we were hungry, we ate it. Uh, then you couldn't sleep, one shift was going, one shift was coming with the, with the, with the, with the wooden shoes, and sail up here to check or somebody escaped. Uh, in the factory we were constantly watched, you couldn't turn, turn your head, we were watched constantly by the Gestapo people uh, to make sure that we don't talk to any, they were foreigners working there, Italians, uh, Czechoslovakian people, um, to make sure that we have no contact with them, that we don't take anything from them. It was hell. What was the worst? In camp, what was the worst? And everything was bad. Walking, uh, hungry, the blisters on your, on your feet. One day we had an idea we'll take off a piece in the camp where you had a straw sack and a blanket, which was very, very rough. Very, the straw sack, no, no sheet, nothing. So one day we got an idea we cut off a piece of blanket to make like a little slipper to, just to put on your feet so, so the, the shoe would be a little smaller. And so we walk, then came the, uh, the commander to, to check how uh, any sabotage is going on and they found out that a piece of blanket was missing. They asked who did it, they said I did it. And, uh, we had a beating from the assessment that his hand was as big as probably four of your hands. I, I had to go up on the on the the, the, the bunk beds. I had to go up on the bunk bed. I couldn't go up because I was dizzy. He gave me on the other hand, but on the other side of the face. Uh, we got we got those heads that we were supposed to cover our head all the time, the head fell off. Uh, I could, he told me to pick it up and put it on, I couldn't find it, I was dizzy. with another beating. Uh, it was hell. What was the worst? The worst was not knowing what's going to happen next not knowing anything what's happening to you, to your members of your family, not knowing when the end will come, who's going to be killed next. Everything was bad. Fear, cold, hunger, Unknown. This lasted for about eight months. Uh, towards the end, when the, the Russians were already approaching, they uh, we didn't work already in the aeroplane factory. Their mind wasn't, uh, German's mind wasn't already on it. And uh, so a hundred girls were picked to work on the 
to Czechoslovakia border, railroad, and railroad uh, tracks. And that's what we did. I was so small and so frail, and, and I had to with a, with a big, uh, what's called, spaddle? Shovel. Shovel, yeah. Uh, carrying stones, rocks. And uh, how much did you weigh at this time? Who knows? Mm -hmm. Probably no more than 85, 90 pounds. Who knows? Who was, was gay? Who saw something? I remember one thing that when we marched to the, to the airplane factory, when we saw a window, and I looked at it, and I saw, and I saw myself. I turned away my head. It looked like a shadow. So we walked at the uh, railroad tracks. Hundred girls is what a hundred lucky one, because there were the Czechoslovakian people walking there too, and they always they had to what is the word braving the the Germans to let so they should can can give us something so they gave us a slice of bread or something. How did they, they pick it. you? How did they select the hundred? How did they select? Mm -hmm. Probably the one that looked healthier than the others. We all look, we all look like hell, but... Uh, you had a selection and you would line up yeah, in fives? Yeah, yeah. Lined up and they, they picked it. Probably who, whoever looked better yet, younger, better, I don't know. How many? hundred. Out of how many? A hundred and we had to but, march a uh, few kilometers mm -hmm. back and forth. But we were the lucky one because we got something to eat. And sometimes we brought home something for the girls in the camp, uh, but they didn't get out anymore at all. In the in the in the aeroplane factory, as dangerous as it was, but there were Italians who were in labor camps. They risked their lives and they brought us something. They showed us with the eyes where they put it. In mean, fact, where I was working at the machine, there was a, a German, an elderly gentleman, and he used to bring me something, he used to show me where he put it, and I picked it up. So, that's something. If he was caught, he would have been taken to concentration camp, too. How German. many How many people were in the camp? In the... In the munitions family. Uh, about 400, I think. About 400, mostly from Lodzgetto and then to Stan, some Hungarian uh, girls mm -hmm. came from Hungary. They, they looked much better than we did because we were already in the ghetto a few years and they were taken straight from their homes to concentration camps. But they didn't, they didn't survive because we were already systematically used uh, to that uh, Terrible life. They they didn't survive. They they got sick and they died. May fifteen, nineteen ninety five. He's an interviewer, Chicago, Illinois. I'd like to take you back into the Lodge Ghetto. And I'd like you to describe for us what you remember about the ghetto. How big was it? What streets were included? How was it um, separated? Was it a wall or barbed wire? Okay, how it was separated with barbed wire? Um, the, the middle of the street that belonged to the Germans. There was the traffic, buses, streetcars. They built a high bridge to go from one side of the street to the other because we couldn't we couldn't cross the streets. Okay. The, the, the streets was for the Germans. The sidewalks was ours, so they built a high bridge. Uh, we lived on this side of the ghetto, we had to go to the walk on the opposite side of the ghetto. So we had to walk as weak as we were, with that nourishment that we had. 
we had to climb the stairs. There were a lot of stairs to climb. And uh, this was the separation. And you went yeah, over the bridge? Over the bridge, yeah. There were two, I recall. Um, one was on Alexander, your name, yes, your name was yes, please. Please. Alexandroska. Oh, the other one was Skierska, I think. Skierska, there was a, a small town where it was Gersh. So they named it Skierska. G E R? No, Z G I E R S K I K A. That's how we. That's how we crossed to go to to walk. Uh, we went to walk in that in that uh, bus shop. As I said, my my mother had to walk to walk so far. Uh, as long as we could walk, walk, they kept us. When we got sick, uh, bad luck. Now, who checked you going in and coming back, going out and coming back? You didn't have to. You didn't face. You didn't face the Germans. You didn't face the Germans. You went from your place to the to the to the uh, shop, dress shop, which was like a shop, in factory. Which was also yeah. in the ghetto. It was in the ghetto, right? So we didn't. Uh, Did you ever go out of the ghetto? No. If you try to escape, uh, once we had to go witness uh, hanging somebody who was trying to, we were forced to go, somebody who was trying to escape the ghetto. We were forced to go witness. It was like a middle of the street in one, in one s square. Do you remember which one? Yeah, this was not far from Lutomiaska. It's mentioned in one of those books that you mm. have about the larger ghetto. <coughs> this was a very pleasant experience, of course. We they, tried, they were trying to show us what happened, what happened to us if we tried to escape the ghetto. I mean, trying to escape was through barbed wires, but yet people took a chance. And they caught one, and we had to go witness the hanging. Of Was it the first person. time you saw somebody killed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we saw the, the Jewish machas, you know, they were the Germans, they were dressed well, they looked well, they... This was their work. I mean, I don't think they had to. They could have refused, but they did it. This Are you talking about Rumkowski? Rumkowski and his staff, yeah. It was like a little Jewish army. Yeah. And they had to cooperate with the Germans and uh, didn't do us any good because they had to, to deliver a quarter of people, whatever, and. Uh, they gave them the information, the instructions. Was it a Jewish police force or a mixed police force? It was in the ghetto, it was a Jewish police force, yeah. Good looking, strong one, they were dressed well. Boots and... Did you ever meet Rumkowski or see him? Or? I, I saw him, but I never met him. No. Describe him. Well, he was an elderly man, very distinguished looking. Uh, looked like my grandfather. But didn't behave like your grandfather. For sure not. What else can I say about him? What was your impression about him, and what was the general impression about him? That, that he cooperates with the Germans at our cost. We didn't, we, as a matter of fact, 
we were told we didn't, we didn't even get the food that we were supposed to get. That most of it went to them, the people who were working at the different uh, departments. They helped themselves with, with, with the things that we were supposed to get. They looked terrific. And Koski and his staff, and what was my impression? My impression was that he's not my friend. Do you think it would have made any difference if he had been less cooperative? Well, at least it wouldn't hurt that your own Jew helps, helps the Germans. Probably would make a difference, make it harder for them. It wasn't only him, he had a whole staff. It was like a little, like a little, uh, like a little country for himself, you know, like a little, I can't think of the word that I could use. Like a little Yiddish Medina. Like a little Jewish country. Yeah. Did the people ever um, have uprisings against him or try and get yeah. him out? Or? Not that I know. A lot of things was going on that I didn't know. I was frightened. I was well, how did, you, how did you know? what you did know. How did you get any news or find out we didn't. anything? We didn't. We didn't. Just rumors. We didn't. There any no newspaper? There was no radio. There was no newspaper. There was no library. We were cut off from everything. We didn't know. Were there schools going on in, in these times? The children were taken away from parents. Uh, you heard about those stories that the Germans took the children by the tongues and threw them down from the third, fourth floor. There were no schools, no. no. I, I'm trying to think how, how that little uh, girl, that uh, little child of my cousins, she was constantly hidden. I don't, I don't remember seeing any children there. Whoever couldn't walk, they didn't care. Right. Everybody had to walk, and kids couldn't walk. I really don't remember any, any schools or any children. Mm -hmm. Now, you had come from a religious family. A very religious family, a civic family. And how did you manage in the ghetto to keep to a Jewish life? Did you know other Hasidic no, families? No, no meat. No meat was given. I, towards the end, I think the, there was a ration of horse meat given mm -hmm. that we refused to eat. That's why I read in that book, mm -hmm. meat and cottage sheets. We never saw that. We never saw that. Whatever, whatever, whatever we got was was like what, a piece of bread and kohlrabi and, and uh, maybe two potatoes a week. And what they gave us is the uh, ersatz coffee. What they make, uh, it wasn't actually coffee. It was uh, dry oats. Uh, the, the things what. What is what what it falls off when you when you husks right. like postum right right yeah. So how did you manage to have um, a Shabbat or a holiday in the ghetto? We had a holiday. We didn't even know there was no calendar. Nothing. That's why I don't remember dates. We didn't have a calendar. Mm -hmm. Shabbat. No, but Shabbat. Did your father 
-hmm. say the prayers in the morning and in the afternoon. Maybe because of that, yeah. But uh, no shoe, no nothing. He had probably his fiddle, but did it before he went to work. I don't, I don't remember any Shabbat, any Shabbat day, no nothing. Well, there are some people who remember more than I do. Uh -huh. It's hard to remember. Yeah, it's, I mean, you were, you were not like a human being. You were like an animal, you know? You were fed like an animal, and, and, and treated like an animal, and, and walked like an animal. You were like a human being. So it's very painful to go back to those memories. I hardly ever do, like in me, I hardly ever do. But I have the picture of my parents very often in front of me. How they look, this is the most, this is the most painful thing, the way my parents looked. How did you say goodbye to each other? Did you? We didn't. You didn't? You thought didn't. you might he see just, each other again? He just took me out and like this, yeah, what do we do? Go back, you don't belong here, and, and that's it. Yes, my mother was happy that she thought, she thought, you know, I'll go back and, and, and it'll still be a family. My sister will come back, my, my, my brother will come back, and they will come back, you know, be somebody to come back to. How long were you alone between the time you left your parents and the time you found your aunt? Oh, this was only a matter of, of two days, two, mm -hmm. three days. I left this this place where we lived in Vishniska and I was with that. And then what? But two more years we were together and then and then we volunteered to go to Auschwitz. Of course we didn't know about Auschwitz. You had no news from the outside no. about no, what no, these no, things not were. At all, not at all, not at all. Not at all. How did people behave to one another? Did and they try and help each other or? Well, you mean at work or? At work or yeah. in the ghetto daily yeah, life? Yeah, but only in, in certain families where that one stole the other's slice of bread. But this one go and gone too. There were certain families like my mother, she insisted that I eat her portion of bread. There were also families that one was stealing from the other, you know. They beautiful families, but under the circumstances, this is how, how people acted. They stole, a sister stole the slice of bread from the brand and vice versa. Mm -hmm. This was going on, what I hear though. What did you think about during those days? Yes, when, when will the end come? When will the end come? We didn't think we'll survive. Just what did you think would happen to you? Well, we thought that we can't, we can't, under the circumstances, we can't live much longer. We'll probably die, or once in a while we, we hear something God. The Russians are approaching, the Americans are approaching. Almost somebody here from somebody in the factory, though they still hope. But there was very little hope. Did you have any um, black humor jokes that you told each other, or songs that you sang, or things to try and keep spirits up? Yeah, sometimes the girls, you know. Mm -hmm. oh, a little more cheerful than that. Most of the time it was sadness, sadness, sadness. Hungry and cold. And what did you have to wear? Nothing, just, just a dress. 
in the ghetto. I don't, yeah, I don't, yeah. No, in the ghetto, no. In the ghetto. the ghetto. No, this wasn't camp. No, but in the in ghetto. In the ghetto, just the clothes what we took with us. Couldn't buy any clothes, nothing. Just, just the clothes what you took. Now, this is the time, had it not been the war, you would have been thinking about getting married. Of course. In your teenage time. My sister time. was supposed to get married short before the war, yeah. A teenager. Did any girls find boyfriends, or did you, in the ghetto was there any kind of social life going on? Not that I know of. There was no social life. Not that I know of. I went to work, come home, hungry, tired, cold. I don't know of any social life. How did you manage to wash yourself or keep neat? In the ghetto. In the ghetto. In the ghetto we had water and camp was uh, was a problem because all we had is that, that striped dress. Mm -hmm. I don't think we even had underwear. So I think what we did in camp that one one Sunday when we were not working was my dress and I don't know how we did. We got two dresses maybe, washed one or the other. All we had is one. But this is in the camp. You asked about the ghetto. Mm -hmm. We had some clothes that we took from home. Because you, you look that. so elegant, so you must have always been neat. I was always a neatnik. I was called in camp a neatnik, yeah. Always, yeah. Elegant, yeah. Ghetto could look elegant, yeah. And neat, yeah. Neat, uh, under the circumstances, yeah. How I kept it clean, I don't know. There was no, there was no shower. There was no bathtub. There was uh, water in a, in a big pen, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, a pail of water. I think we had a little stove that we warmed the water. There's so many things that I don't think, that I don't remember. I should, but I don't. That may be a blessing. Who knows? Who knows? Do you remember mm -hmm. anything about the selections from the ghetto? The selection that I yeah. was telling you? Yeah. Were, they were, more, were religious people taken first? Or was it equal? Was no, difference. no difference. No. There was no difference. We didn't know the difference. Everybody was treated the same in the beginning when they, when they, when the Germans walked in mm -hmm. uh, to lodge. You know, they took uh, the, the men with the beards with the pears and pulled it and cut it off. And without mercy, without. You know, we weren't treated like human beings. You had been brought up um, as a religious girl and praying every day. Were you angry with God? Where did you think God was during this time? You could say so, yeah. Where is God? Why does he let it happen? Why did it have to happen even after the war? Why did it have to happen to my parents? That they were such pious people, such good people. Yeah. Couldn't help it. There were some girls that they were more that accepted it better than, than others. I found it hard to accept it. Why, 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 constantly why?
And in the years since, have you come to a, an answer for yourself or an acceptance for yourself? I guess uh, when, after the war, when things started normalizing, children sent children to school, and decided to accept it. This is, this is God's will, and and I have to accept it. Yeah. What else was there to do? I have to make the best of it. What is it about yourself, do you think, that helped you survive all these difficulties? I, mean, I probably had a very strong foundation. Uh, I still think it's a miracle that I'm the way I am. I'm, I got in good health. And I think I'm normal, psychologically. I, I, really can, I think it's a miracle, I really do. I really do. After going through what I went through, that I can be the way I am, I think it's a miracle. Um, you know, that's how Hashem wants it, you know. What else, how else can you answer this? And so after the war, did you become religious again? After the war, of course, it's always in me. I was born and brought up that way. Uh, I remember the, the first Shabbat when I was on my way from Czechoslovakia to Germany, where we all gathered. From there, we were supposed to make Aliyah or come to the United States. I met... Uh, religious girls from Hungary, who were always more religious than, than the Polish. And it was a Friday, and they lighted candles, and they lighted candles, too. And this was the first time that I went back to Yiddishkeit. This was 1946, 45? This was 1946, yeah. End of 45. 45, end of 45. And then I met my husband. What did that feel like, the lighting the candles? It felt good. It felt that this, this still a continuation, still the Jews alive and observing. And uh, I think it was the first time a feeling of Normalization. This was on the way from uh, Czechoslovakia to to Germany. We were supposed to go to Israel or to United States. So between this time that you lit the candles and the time before that you lit the candles, how many years was it? This is the first time. I never did before. This was the first time I did. In your whole life? Yeah. Well, a single girl didn't light at home. A single girl didn't light the candles when we married. At home, I never lighted the candles. My mother did. Mm -hmm. You know, only when you married, you light the Shabbat candles. The but now, candles. since Lubavitch, even little girls, they oh, have light Lubavitch. candles. Oh, to Lubavitch. No, I'm not. No. But yeah, at home, mother always did. This is the first time mm. we lighted candles. Yeah. Single girls never lighted candles. Mm. Then I met my husband, and take me back toward the. Um, end of the war time. Okay, the end of the war. I was liberated in Czechoslovakia. I by was the Russians. By the Russians. I was 
But you were we working on the railroad. On the railroad. And then, then when the Germans did let us go, because the Czechoslovakian people gave them money, cigarettes, whatever they didn't have themselves enough, they gave them to let us go. Then um, so they, they gathered us in, in that Czechoslovakian town, Nachod, in a school. Then different families came and took home the girls. The hundred girls or all the no, girls? No, this, this was the whole camp. Oh, sorry, not the hundred girls. The whole, the whole camp. The Germans let us go because there was already chaos. They weren't afraid already to, to let us go. Um, then a few of the girls were taken home to Czechoslovakian families. Uh, I was one of them. And uh, we were there for a few months. We even were working. And then we said, it's time to go home to Poland to see who, as soon as we could, the Russians allowed us, to see who survived, who didn't. So we went. I think the Red Cross took care of it, of the arrangements, the trip and everything. And unfortunately, uh, no one, no one, survived, except a uh, second cousin who was in, in Lodge that which survived. Uh, then we went back there. Back to? To, to Czechoslovakia, to that uh, to little town, Nachod. N-A? And then we found N-A-C-H-O-D, Nachod. And who was the family who took you home? Who took me? I don't remember the name. They were a beautiful family. They were a beautiful family. They took me. I looked like a monkey. No hair and, and, and the dress, that, that, that uh, striped dress, that's all I had. And they took me, they nurtured me, and uh, they gave me clothes. And we were there for a few weeks, and they treated me like their own child. They even gave me their own bed. Did they have children and too? There was there was a, a aunt uh, and and uh, a niece and a nephew. They were raised by that aunt. Uh, they were orphans. And they were raised by that aunt. And they were such good people. Uh, I was there for a few weeks until they said, "We let you go." You gain a little strength, and, and you look like a human being. <laughs> and you look like a monkey. And then a few of the girls went back to Poland and uh, to look who survived, unfortunately. How did you go? By train. By train. I think it was arranged or uh, a joint or, or the Red Cross. I think the Red Cross. Unfortunately, I didn't find anybody and came back. And then, uh, then we heard already that in Prague there is uh, um, uh, a LIA center and uh, a joint that uh, when people started to register to go to the United States or to, to uh, Israel. And uh, where did you register? Red Cross. There was a, a Jewish uh, gemeinde. No, and you, where did you register to go? Oh, where to Israel. Yeah. May fifteenth, nineteen ninety-five. An interviewer. I'd like to um, have you clarify for me. You said the Russians liberated you. How? Describe that to me. The day it happened and, and the scene. How okay. does it look? When it happened is when I was already in Czechoslovakia with that family because don't forget that I had left the camp. Uh huh. That's the part I I wasn't clear about. Right. So we saw Russians all over and uh, they were trying to be friendly with us. We were afraid of them because um, we had uh, 
certain things that they did to girls. That, um, but they were very friendly. Uh, we met some Jewish Russians that uh, were trying to get information from us. Uh, I remember the Russians, they had a watch was for them. It wasn't like Russia now. It was for them a novelty. They, they took away from Germans or from whoever watches, and they wore watches one, two, three, up to here. Um, they were drunk <laughs> most of the time. Um, I had very little contact with them. I was with that Czechoslovakian family. It was different if I were in the camp. I was liberated by them, you know, directly. But I was already with the with the families, and we just got up and we saw mm -hmm. Russians coming there. Were there still no. Germans in the camp, or no. had they run away? They ran away. They ran away, or, or they were taken prisoners of war. You know, or we didn't go to the camp. Right. That's why I didn't see the no. I understand. The liberation. Now I need to ask you about. Um, in the camp, it was for aircraft parts at, at, at yeah. Bad Cordova, C-O? Yeah. It was actually, it was in, in Glatz. The camp was in Bad Cordova. The Could you spell it, please? The, yeah. The name of the German town was Glatz, oh, G-L-A-T-Z. On the German side, it was a border town. Right. The German side was Glatz, and the Czechoslovakian side was Nachot. No. And when we walked, and what was Bad Road, Cordova? The name of the camp was, was Bad Cordova. It was C O R D O V A. C U D O V A. Bad uh -huh. Cordova. Yeah. It was. It was a bad. So we never saw. We never saw. More. The rest of it, just this what we, uh -huh. when we marched to, to uh, from the camp to the factory. So a bar was, so. was a spa. Must have been a spa. Bar is a uh, spa. Yeah, a cool art. Uh, you know. was, it a spa. was it beautiful, the countryside around? Who saw it? Mm. All we saw is, is, is the camp and, and, and the way to the camp, which we didn't see much of the town. Now, where did you live when you were there? In barracks? In barracks. Barracks, yeah. And the overseers barracks, were? Barracks, uh, um, bunk beds, what straws, if we know. The overseer, the, it, was, it was in the country. It was out of, out of, like, uh, out, of the, out, of the, out of the city. You know. Suburb, you can call it the suburb. It was just outskirts, mm -hmm. the outskirts. And what exactly did you make there? It was certain the machine, mm -hmm. certain parts of uh, what goes, certain parts of the uh, airplane, ammunition airplane. We were told it's, it's aircraft company, and, and, and we had to be so careful because if something went wrong, it was called sabotage. You had to be very, and you very had to careful be careful that you didn't lose a finger right, or something. Right, right, right. There was always a supervisor. Uh, a Czech or a German, and we were not supposed to communicate. Uh, we were constantly watched not to communicate, not to say something. Constantly watched, right? Assess women, assess men. Mm -hmm. And this was 12 hours. And I remember one thing we were so hungry that on the way, we, we watched under supervision, that on the way to Betri, we call which is a factory. Uh, we saw potato peels. We went down to pick up, and we didn't know. And we got a beating for it. Imagine that we wanted to eat potato peels that you pick up in the street. That's how hungry we were. Were you? Um, did you make like a family, the girls together, in the bunk? So it all. There were but twenty girls in one in one room. And we cooperated, we didn't fight, we family. Like next to next one who slept to you know, like it's like a sister, you know. Did 
Did you keep with contact? With clothes. Did I keep what? Contact after the war. No, we didn't know. We didn't know. Where this one went, we didn't know. No, coincidentally, came, he came. I came across with uh, two days. They died already. With two days, were already on the same camp, in the same room, coincidentally. Some, some went to Italy, some went to Israel, some went, you know, the one. So you signed up to go to Palestine. Right. Now the yeah. war is over. Yeah. Yeah. And by this time, I was I was married. I met my husband. Where? How? In in uh, in Prague. I met my husband. How did you get yeah. to Prague? Well, when we left, when we left Nachod, when we heard that that uh, there is already immigration, that you have to register, you had to go to Nachod. Mm -hmm. So I met my husband and, uh, on, on the train from, from, from Nahot to, to Prague. And they were with, with those two girls from, from Hungary. And that's when it started. Do you remember what he said, what you said? Uh... Yeah, well, we went, uh, this, was, this was before, before Prague. Yeah, this was before Prague. He was also on his way from Germany. And we were going to go to Karlsbad from, from, from Nachot. And then because it was Friday, Shabbat was coming, we arranged to stay in Karlsbad over Shabbat. And he saw me and the two guests, and we lighted the candles. and. Uh, started conversation and this was the beginning. The Where was she from? Krakow. My husband from Krakow, Poland. <coughs> he was liberated in, in, in Germany. From where? Uh, Flossenburg. He was in the worst camps. He was, his family was there where in Poland where Schindler's List to place plush of me, let's remember those names mm -hmm. from Schindler's List. This is where his family was. I, I never knew his family. So after, after a few months, uh, yeah, we went to Prague and I stood in a Red Cross center together with those two girls and he was somewhere else, but we kept on seeing each other. And uh, the end of 1945, we got married. And in 1946, we came. We uh, got married in Prague. We got married in Prague in 1946. Yeah, then we registered for, for the immigration. And we went to, to Germany, had to go back to, to Germany. Couldn't immigrate from Czechoslovakia. So we went to Germany and we lived in that uh, DP camp. What was the name and of it? Fernwald. F-E-R-N-W-A-L-D, Fernwald camp. Um, How did he propose? He proposed, say, well, I'm alone, you were alone. <laughs> you know, we talked about our backgrounds, similar backgrounds. He liked the idea that I lighted the candle, also from an Orthodox family. Mm -hmm. He lighted, lighted the candle. Uh, this was his family's picture there. We we'll see family. it, yeah. yeah. We'll see. Uh, and then, uh, what was your wedding? I, left. I didn't have anybody, didn't have anybody, so we like each other, let's get married. What was your wedding mm -hmm. like? <laughs> this, is, this is interesting, our wedding. This was in Prague, Czechoslovakia. I didn't have anybody, he didn't have anybody. There was a rabbi from Hungary. He had a uh, few nieces. Uh, they made the wedding. I, um, she bought me an address for the wedding, that it would be good now for a housewife's dress. What did it look like? And uh, 
housewife dress, I would say. White or one no, of those terrible prints? No, or? Like, like, like a print, yeah. Mm. What an elegant housewife wouldn't wear it now. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and uh, he was the rabbi, and they made potatoes. What was his name, the rabbi? Do you remember? Rappaport. I think he came oh. to America. I heard that he was a shaman somewhere in, in New York. And they made, they made the wedding. And uh, what was there? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, we, we got the rations from UNRWA and joined cigarettes that we didn't smoke. So we sell the cigarettes, he bought me a ring. We didn't have anything, anybody, anything. And uh, what was the ring? A gold ring? Or? Must have been a silver ring. Mm. I don't have it anymore. Broke. <laughs> uh, and that, uh, in that rabbi's house was the wedding. We, what they served is potatoes and herring, I <laughs> remember. And I think it was um, beer, Prague beer. <laughs> and then we came to Germany. For we your didn't honeymoon? Stay. We didn't the honeymoon, yeah. Yeah, we didn't stay long there. And we came to Germany, we came to Ferenbad. And my older one was born in Germany, in, in Schwarzenfeld. I told you about the Schwarzenfeld, where we moved from from Ferdinand to Schwarzenfeld. I didn't I, ask you your husband's name for the uh, tape. His name is Shalom, Shalom Knobloch. Shalom, it means peace. Shalom Knobloch. Um, and your son from Germany? My son was born in Germany in Schwarzenfeld, the older one, the one who's in Israel. What's his name? Aaron. And, uh, Aaron, he was named after both fathers, after my father and after my husband's father, Abraham Aaron. And uh, when he was about two years old, he was born in 1948, and he came to the United States in 1950. We, uh, we didn't go to Israel, obviously. We came to the United States. My husband said, no, we don't have anything. And we'll go for about two, three years to America. If we get something, then we go to Israel to make some money. We never did, but our kids did. Did you have family here? No. No. None of, none of my husband's family survived. So you just picked Chicago to come to, or? Well, that's what the joint, the Hayas, sent us to. Uh -huh. You know, we didn't come on our own. Join together with the Hayas. They brought us over. And how did you find your reception in Chicago? We came, first of all, we were told that we're going to New York. And when we came to New York, they told us we're going to Chicago. Uh, I had read uh, Germany, uh, Sinclair Lewis. Um, What's the name of that book? I remember in Polish I read it from the disco. Main Street? The Sinclair Lewis wrote it about the crime in Chicago. Oh. And I cried. I didn't say, this is what I'm really going to. We told all Chicago's gangsters. I had no choice to let him. He came to Chicago. And we had a very warm reception from the joint, the Hayas. They took us to it was a hotel for the refugees on 1960 West Jackson Boulevard, very bad area. And we were there for about eight months, I would say. And then we got an apartment on 4960 Drexel on the south side. South side. My husband went to work, we did all kind of work. And did you speak any English or your husband? Yeah, we took in Germany. Well, we lived in Germany. There was a professor in the, in the Deutsche Gymnasium who learned English, and he was our neighbor. And we gave him cigarettes again, the things that we got. Our ration, after the war, we got rations from the joint in UNRWA. We gave him things, and he taught that English. So we, we knew a little, not, not too much, but a little. Uh, 
the way he taught us to concentrate so much. When you say the, don't say the, but say the, the, put the tongue between the lips, and we came here and nobody did it. So it was a waste of time. But anyhow, then we met some people that knew my husband's parents. That they came here before the war, and they, it was a very warm reception. And things started to normalize. So you have the one son who was born in Germany. And Chaim was born here. Chaim was born here. Yeah. Two sons. Two sons, right. Chaim was born, yeah, where we lived on Kribbe, the south side, and then we moved from the south side, and this, and every, every, well, it was moving away from the south side to Clifton. It was not, not far from where the, uh, you know, Hill Torah School, mm -hmm. the Hill Torah Center, was on Broadway and Broadway and Melrose. So that's where we enrolled Aaron to the day school. So your children brought you back to observance? Yeah, they went, they went to public school, to Jewish day school, and one thing led to the other. No, we already, well, in fact, my husband even organized on the boat. We came, we didn't come by plane, we came by, by ship. The name of the ship was Makarte. Uh, there was a Jewish Captain, the captain of the army, he helped him organize a kosher kitchen on the, on the ship. So it started yet. Uh -huh. so, yeah. Slowly, slowly. Okay, okay. Don't forget the background that he had. Then you, you met people, and that's what it led to. Did you work here in the States, or were you yeah, a housewife? We lived, we lived on the south side. And uh, little English, as I, as I knew, I, there was the Billing Hospital, part of the University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I got the job, was accepted, I got the job as a filing girl. And they liked me very much. And then I had to go to the hospital, had my tonsils removed. And uh, they waited for me to come back, and I had some complications, and come back, and then they and they got somebody else, but I liked the job, and they liked me. And uh, then I got involved with the wig business that I told you that I picked up mm -hmm. in the ghetto, and I found out that somebody here is doing it, so I pursued this. It was more lucrative. And your husband died? My husband... He died in what year? Eight years ago. Only eight years ago. My husband uh, went to correspondence school, got uh, uh, a degree in business. Uh, he was insurance man. He was he was towards the end he was successful, but he got sick. He was a good salesman. He was an insurance man. He was, he was a bookworm, he was a self-educated man because he was taken away from his bar mitzvah to camp, to concentration mm -hmm. camp. So you made a good life here? Made a good life in spite of what you had been through? It wasn't bad. We had a house in Lincolnwood. Mm -hmm. After my husband died, I sold the house in Lincolnwood and moved here. Towards the end, we did that plan. Is there anything that I haven't asked you that you would like to say? Or is there any message you'd like to say for your children and your grandchildren? <sighs> my children, my grandchildren. Uh, I hope they'll never have to go through what we went through. We did our best to raise two good sons. The honorable people, 
well respect the raising of beautiful families and this is our this is our help me with the word legacy say, legacy right we carry on carry on our legacy because I don't know how much longer I will live. There's no one else alive from my husband's family or from my family to talk about it, to reminisce it, to... So I hope that they'll have a good life and they'll never have to go through what we went through. No one, no one in the world will have to go through what we went through. Let's hope that it will be a nicer, a nicer world, better people, that somebody will learn something from those records, that we survivors are living. Did you ever talk to them about your experiences? To my kids? Mm -hmm. When they, when they ask me, I don't, I don't volunteer when they ask me. Lately more, because I went to every Shabbat with Chaya. But uh, I'm asked, I, my granddaughter in, in, in Israel had to make once a, a paper. So she sat down and asked me all kinds of questions, and I answered as much as I could. And she was so sensitive, and she saw that I can't say, but let's stop now. She held my hand. So this is... My husband was very active here in the community in the bands of Israel, in the shul. Here are pictures of him there on the wall. He was the chairman of the band dinner for about 18 years. He was the guy of the shul. He was so active in the community. and. A good human being, well liked, well respected. If people talk about him, they say he was he was just different. They don't come like this. And thank God that I had the privilege to be his wife and raise two wonderful sons. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing with us. Thank you. I did the best I could. I, under the circumstances, I know I could have done better had I, had I not been a more emotional person as I am. And I can't help it. Emotions take over. And I think as clear as I, as I, as I should. Oh, you were fine. And we're very grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Go. Go. Oh, here. This photograph is. I should say, oh, this photograph is the family of my husband, Shalom. Um, the only person I know I met is the uncle, which is Yitzhak Kirschenbaum. And he passed away in Israel about uh, five years ago. And where is he in the photograph? In the photograph, he is. Can I show you? He's in the middle? In the middle. Back row. In the middle. With. Yeah. Describe it. He's got a beard. In the middle, a beard and a, sh and a streimel and a mustache. Mm -hmm. Okay, and my father in law is left right to him, the third. Him, there's a uh, girl in between, and then he's a third. This is a picture of my husband's family. His father is in the back between the two guys in the back, where he's a beard and a streimel. And next to him is Uncle Yitzhak Kirschenbaum. He was, it was taken in Khshanov, probably 1934, 35, I don't know exactly. This is a picture taken after the war in Schwarzenfeld. 
uh, my husband is in the talis making the elimagachmim, the uh, prayer after the death, oh, and and this was the cemetery where people who were killed just before the Nazis uh, you know, left. This is Schwarzenfeld, Germany. This picture was taken in Schwarzenfeld, 1947. I was pregnant with my older son, Aaron. It's me and my husband. My husband is Shulam Knobloch, Rose Knobloch. This picture was taken in Schwarzenfeld, 1948. Aaron is about uh, six weeks old. Uh, this is Alice and her husband and her brother, I think, that they took me into it after the, to the house, after the liberation, and they treated me very, very well, they took care of me like their own child. Mm -hmm. Where is this? Uh, this was Nachot, 1945. Nachot, Czechoslovakia, 1945. This is my uncle, Moshe Gerber, with whom I stood for a short time before the war. They went to Warsaw Ghetto and did not survive. To the right is my aunt. Chaya Gerber, the wife of Moshe Gerber, with whom I stood in Lodge. They went to Warsaw Ghetto, did not survive. The one to the right. Oh, 